Hey everybody, today we'll be talking about scam baiting. The practice of talking to scammers, pretending you don't know what's going on, wasting their time, and having a big laugh about it on the internet. Woo woo! Yes, yeah, do it! <laughs> <laughs> what about you? Can you do it? Hey, say nice words. But I'm gonna talk about it in a way that I think might make people a bit uncomfortable. So I wanted to start off by saying two things. First, scammers are doing a really bad thing. They steal from innocent people and prey on the elderly and all that. Second, scam baiting is a fine thing to do. It's good, even, to waste the time of a person doing a bad thing. So, now that we've made these moral claims, I want us to forget about them. I watch scam baiting videos all the time, and I'll tell you right now, I don't do it because scammers are bad and scam baiters are virtuous. Rather, I watch them because I like them, because they're funny, because they're art I enjoy. And this is how I want to talk about scam baiting as a kind of art, as a series of signs and relationships that communicate something to us. For the rest of this video, I want you to imagine something. That these videos are all fictional. A play written by somebody who wanted to create a meaningful experience. And if you imagine that, the next question is clear. What's the play about? What's going on in it? Part 1. Setting the Scene Okay. Let's begin this conversation by asking a question. What is the average American's relationship to the working-class people of somewhere like India? Now, of course, this question is cursed from the outset because there is no one answer. There are people with Indian friends and pen pals. There are Indian Americans with family in India, and the list goes on. But let's blur our eyes here and give an answer that probably most people can relate to. We know the working class people of India through customer support. When I have a problem with my internet or want something returned or something like that, I can very easily find myself talking to an Indian person who will help me fix it. This is a strange relationship, right? The first word that comes to mind to describe it is robotic. The conditions and training involved in being an Indian customer support worker obscure the sense that the worker you're talking to is a person, a person who lives in another country. Many of these people work the graveyard shift, essentially live their lives on American time in India because they have to receive our calls. They are taught not to speak with an American accent exactly, but to be accentless, easily understandable to us. And they practice English and practice losing their accents for hours at a time. They're taught to give a Western name because as one customer support trainer says, tell an American your name is Raja and an F word pops out. Better to use a fake name. And just in general, much of their labor is emotional in nature, as they have to patiently and calmly deal with irate American clients who want to be serviced and who are often mad that they're speaking to an Indian. So, in all ways, the interaction between an American and an Indian customer support worker is defined by a performed absence. The worker's identity, their time, their emotions, their accent, their culture, their name, are all obfuscated as much as possible so as to create a homogeneous, accessible, and non-threatening experience for the American user. And this is the relationship that a scammer is interested in. There are a lot of scams out there, from the standard, I'm a Nigerian prince and if you send me $300 I'll give you 10 million, to the newer identity theft scams, where somebody pretending to work for the IRS says your identity has been stolen and you need to send money to fix the situation. But in this video, I want to focus on one scam you often see coming from Indian call centers, customer support scams. Your computer fails, or you want a refund, or to cancel a payment. So you look up a number on Google and find one that's close to the top, and you find yourself talking to a scammer who ends up hijacking your computer and stealing your money through any number of methods. 
So I want to start off by saying a kind of simple observation, that the work of a legitimate customer support worker and that of a scammer are eerily similar, both in terms of methods and aesthetics. They both follow a script, a tightly organized series of steps and procedures. They both have to be incredibly patient with Western clients, often teaching them the very basics of how to operate a computer. They both speak with a helpful and somewhat distant tone. They both use a fake name. None of this stuff is a coincidence, of course. The entire point of a customer support scam is to convince people that it's the real thing so you can get their money. But even as this point might be obvious, it is very strange, I think. Just a few minutes ago, I was saying that to the American consumer, the existence of an Indian tech support worker is founded on an absence, on service with an enforced lack of identity or perceptible culture. And if that is the case, then what are we supposed to make of this scammer? This figure who plays the same part that a customer support worker plays, who evokes that same absence, but who is lying about their purpose on a fundamental level, trying to extract your money to gain power at your expense. And if the customer support worker is interpolated as a robot, then what exactly is a scammer? Part 2. The Plot well, it seems to me that the work of a scam baiter exists on some level to ask and explore that question. And in this part of the video, I want to, uh, explore that exploration. So, I basically just said that the work of a scammer is similar to that of a legitimate customer support worker. But I think this statement was slightly misleading, and that's for one reason. Scammers aren't particularly hard to spot. I don't want to judge anybody for falling for one of these things. It can happen to anybody. But the truth is, if you're internet literate and know a few basic things, you'll be fine 100% of the time. A legit customer support worker will not ask for bank details. They won't try to take over your screen. And I mean, look. The way a refund scam works is to give your mark the impression that you accidentally sent way too much money, freak out, tell them you'll lose your job if the money isn't returned to you, and then get them to go to a department store and buy thousands of dollars worth of gift cards for you. This is all to say, from the outside, a scammer does not appear to most people as a copy of a real customer support worker but instead as this strange simulacra, doing things and behaving in ways that are completely strange and alien to a legit customer service relationship. Sure, a scammer might look like a normal worker if you blur your eyes, but they are obviously and fundamentally different. And this difference is where the scam baiter lives. Today, we're going to be focusing on Kit Goba, probably the most famous scam baiter and one who mostly does customer support scams. And to watch one of his videos is to see him methodically pull at every string possible, engage with and illuminate all of the strange things about scammers while pretending like he has no idea what's going on. Looking at a video like Ethical Hacker called out when his scam fails, we can see that Kit Goba asks about a million questions. Why do you need me to fill out this strange form with all of my personal information? Like, you called me to give me my money back. Why would I fill this out? Can I just have my... Can I have my money, please? Why do you need me to log into my bank on my computer as opposed to my phone? Oh, no, I'm actually... Yeah, I'm actually logging on my phone right now. Hold on. Not from the phone, madam. You have to do it from the computer. No, it's fine. It's what normal reason could you possibly have for that? Why aren't I allowed to turn my computer off? It's malfunctioning. Did you turn it off? Yeah, I told you I turned it off. Why? Because it was flashing on and off and on and off. No, like, and it... Why are you writing those strange numbers? How did you end up sending me all this money? Wait, why do I have to go to Target? We want Target gift card. We want Target gift card for $3,500. 
Why do you want a Target gift card? At every step, the scammer and his practice are interrogated until the dysfunctional and almost absurd nature of his work is brought into light. And what does this interrogation mean? What does it accomplish? Well, we might say that it's a break from the established order. I mean, think about it this way. Everything that's mechanical about the relationship between an American and an international customer support worker is stripped away here. The real customer support worker often seems to follow a step-by-step -step guide to help you solve your problem. But because the scam baiter asks so many questions, the scammer is forced to go off script. So you give me my refund on your computer, and I'm not going to write it on a piece of paper okay, okay, like a no cavewoman. No I'm going to type it okay, like a I modern, modern girl like I, I am on my notepad. Okay. All right, I'm typing it for you, okay? I'm typing. You don't do anything. I'm doing this just to ruin his whole scam. Like, obviously it doesn't make sense. He doesn't... He wouldn't need to use that? my I'm computer, 35. but I'm just giving him a hard time. The legit worker is both detached from and a representative of the company they work for. They don't see the profits of Microsoft, they aren't particularly invested in what the company does or makes, yet when you speak to them, it's implied that their words somehow come from the company itself its authority, its desires. But with this interrogation, the scammer is revealed to be acting entirely for his own benefit. As the scammer points out and laughs at, there is no real authority behind the scammer's requests. Microsoft doesn't take payment in Steam gift cards. He's asking you to do things because he wants you to do them. That's it. The legit worker never shows much emotion or personality. As we've already described, their job is uniquely catered toward treating Americans and other Western clientele with kid gloves. But by the end of many of these videos, the scammer can no longer keep up that fiction. After being picked at and picked at, sometimes for multiple hours, the scammer is often outwardly angry, insulting the scam baiter, justifying their actions, etc. You are a f idiot and you're out of mind, okay? In every possible way, these scam baiting interrogations remove the facade that the worker you're talking to has no identity, no agency. And so, the Western audience is presented here with a vision that unsettles its understanding of international labor. Looking at a video like this, I can't see a non-threatening, culturally neutered, mechanical interaction that is tailored exclusively to my needs. No, what I see is that system in dysfunction. A broken robot. A person. Part 3. Climax. Watching a scam baiting video, it's obvious who we're going to root for. I mean, as I said at the very beginning, scammers are doing a very bad thing, harming people. And so, it's only natural for us to want them to lose, want the scam baiter to win. What's more, there's no real suspense in a video like this. Before we even start watching, we know that nobody's about to get scammed, that the scammer will be duped. And by the end of the video, all we do is laugh at the dude. At his flimsy plot. At his deluded belief that he was actually gonna pull his scheme off. At how mad he gets when he realizes it won't work. At how shitty he is. As such, the video provides a sense of closure and reassurance. Sure, the scammer presents a threat. A threat to our money, and more importantly here, a threat to our understanding of international labor. But that's all being taken care of now. The scammer has lost, the story is over, and any sense of his agency can be put in this neat little prank call box, enjoyed, and forgotten about, right? Well, I'm not so sure it can be as simple as that. Because even though we can laugh with these videos and feel morally vindicated by them, there's something kind of sticky and haunting about the whole thing, isn't there? And to explain why I say that, let me end this video by telling you about the moment I decided to make this video. At one point, as I was watching the video, figure it out later. The scammer, now in control of Kit Goba's computer, tries to open up his webcam and look at him. I opened his webcam. 
Um, no, there's better. I'm not really. I don't really look good right now. But thank you for asking. Oh, ma'am, um, no problem, ma'am. I have no problem, better pictures. No problem. There's a lot better pictures on my computer. Okay, yeah. Well, no, I just I don't want to. I don't want you to see me without makeup or anything. You know. Hey, no. This is a fairly common thing for scammers to do. Apparently, you can see it here. Do you have a camera on your computer? No. Um. No, I'm sorry. And here. They continue to watch her for several minutes. And I find this practice scary in every sense of the word. It's scary viscerally, of course, because it's a complete invasion of privacy, this voyeuristic, non-consensual act. But it's also scary in a more abstract way, I think. See, our relationship with workers of the Global South is defined by a series of transactions. Transactions which we don't really think about for the most part. Beyond even customer service, which I've obviously already talked about, what mental image do we in the Western world have in the places where our coffee is picked? The manufacturing of our iPhones done? The materials for our computers mined? Well, if you're me, not a very clear picture at all. And so, in this moment between a scammer and a scam baiter, we see something outside of this strange system of transactions we've become so accustomed to. There is no big reason for the scammer to look at the face of the person he's talking to, at least not one that I've heard. There is no money to be gained there. Rather, him doing that can only be explained with two incredibly simple, incredibly human facts. First, when you call up some number with your customer support needs, a scammer or a legit worker, they don't know what you look like. Second, they might want to. So that's the end of the video. Uh, I thought this was kind of a weird niche one and maybe a bit confusing, but I hope you liked it, uh, and if you did, feel free to like, comment, subscribe, give me money on Patreon, etc. The art for this video was done by Moth Cub, and you can find her link in the description. And now, finally, it's time for my Patreon question of the video. Daffy asks, Do you have any interesting takes on Kung Fu Panda? That would be a fun video. You know, I haven't really seen the Kung Fu Pandas in a while, but I thought they were good. Does that count as an interesting take? That was a terrible answer. Uh, I'm going to ask answer another question. Jacob Friedman asks, What podcasts do you listen to? Zero podcasts. That's two shitty answers for the price of one there. All right. Enjoy it. Enjoy your lives. Bye.